It's hard to believe it's been 45 years since the catastrophic eruption of Mount St. Helens. Allow me to share my own personal experience of May 18, 1980. I was on a school bus returning from a three-day geology field trip with a group of Eastern Washington University students. I was a 28-year-old geology graduate student along on the field trip to assess with the teaching and supervision of a busload of undergrads. The morning of May 18th began gloriously beautiful, calm, and warm. We were on a 300-mile return trip to our Cheney campus, heading for the Cascade Mountain crossing at White Pass. Early on, near the town of Morton, we encountered a roadblock with flashing lights and a looming dark gray cloud up ahead. Unknown to us, Mount St. Helens had suddenly erupted a couple hours earlier at 8.32 a.m. We assumed, however, it was just another minor eruption, like the ones we had seen on TV over the last couple of months. So, White Pass was closed, but surely the next Cascade Crossing, at Snoqualmie Pass, is open to the north, we thought. We backtracked to I-5 before heading northeast toward Snoqualmie Pass. Then, more shocking news, another roadblock. Only then did we realize the seriousness of our situation. Daylight was fading, and our last chance to get over the Cascades was at Stevens Pass. By now, our group of impatient students was growing weary and concerned about getting back to campus as soon as possible in order to prepare and study for final exams. Fortunately, at Stevens Pass, there was no roadblock, only a hastily posted sign alongside the road that read, Road Closed Beyond Wenatchee. As we drove over Stevens Pass to Wenatchee, the ash cloud thickened and quickly enveloped us. Driving through the suffocating ash cloud was surreal. Raining volcanic ash reflected off our headlights like snowflakes, while the still warm ash cloud quickly raised the air temperature into the 80s. As usual, the bus had no air conditioning, and at first we were reluctant to open the new windows and allow a great cloud of ash inside. Eventually, however, the heat was so unbearable that some of us did open the windows for relief from the hot stagnant air inside. Eventually though, while sitting on the bus, the best solution for me was to sit next to an open window while breathing through a water-saturated t-shirt On we traveled, deeper into the heavy, thick ash cloud, for another eight hours. Top speed was only five to ten miles per hour because of the dust cloud that was generated, which significantly reduced visibility. Once suspended, the ash cloud hung in the air like a dense fog. The bus driver intentionally chose back roads with less traffic because every car encountered would whip up a fresh plume of ash, cutting off visibility for all other nearby drivers. It was especially bad near Ritzville, who received the maximum amount of ash accumulation up to five inches deep. Miraculously, we eventually arrived back in Cheney and the Eastern Washington University campus around sunrise the next morning. Just about the time the bus engine seized up and wouldn't restart. Even Cheney, located 230 miles 
northeast of Mount St. Helens, received several inches of gritty gray ash that covered and permeated everything. A few days later, Eastern Washington University administrators shut down the campus and sent all its students home without having to take any of our dreaded final exams. Thank you, Mount St. Helens, for the exciting and memorable experience that I'll never forget, and one I wouldn't trade for anything. Fifty-seven people died during the eruption of Mount St. Helens. The blast zone for Mount St. Helens is clearly visible in images from outer space. The blast was triggered when the top of the mountain slid to the north in a giant landslide, instantly releasing the gases and molten magma below. The lateral blast spread for up to 10 miles to the north, destroying almost everything in its path. Only the more vegetated areas, colored red in this satellite image, escaped the blast. When St. Helens erupted, the north side of the mountain rapidly slid and flowed northward toward Spirit Lake, while creating a new higher feature called the Pumice Plain west of the lake. The Pumice Plain blocked the outlet for Spirit Lake that formerly drained west directly into the Toodle River. After the May 18th eruption, Spirit Lake was 200 feet higher than before the eruption. Engineers soon realized that as the lake rose behind this new obstruction, it could eventually breach the Pumice Plain. This would result in an extremely dangerous, catastrophic flood down the Toodle River and into the populated Castle Rock Longview area downstream. To avoid a new catastrophe like this, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers drilled a 1.6-mile tunnel into the mountainside along the west shore of Spirit Lake. Here's the tunnel entrance located along the western shore of today's Spirit Lake. Since the completion of the tunnel in 1985, the level of Spirit Lake has remained stable thanks to this engineering feat. I've been to Mount St. Helens a few times since the eruption, mostly a windy ridge, which is located immediately northeast of the crater. The following drone video clips were collected here and over Spirit Lake in September 2024.
Thousands of trees were flattened by the lateral blast and mostly aligned northward. Like matchsticks, most trees were snapped off above ground, while other trees were uprooted before aligning in the same direction. Thousands of trees also ended up in Spirit Lake as the blast pushed the lake water up onto the surrounding hills before backwashing into the lake. Today, many thousands of fallen trees are still afloat in Spirit Lake. Most of the floating logs drift in mass by winds that push the log jam from one part of the lake to another.